yeah, naturally, the first question is, tell us the original mission of Soulman and why did you set it up? I mean, you came to retire, so why the, why the itch to set up Soulman? What, what, what were you trying to achieve? Well, there wasn't really an original mission of Soulman, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, after 10 years in Shanghai, I was looking forward to a real rest and change of pace. I'd always had lots of adventures, as, as you noted, but at the same time, I'd always worked so hard and I really felt it was time for a change. I turned 50, or was it 60, I can't remember, 60. And um, I thought, great, I'll come to Bali and, uh, and really take it easy and, and have a wonderful time. Um, wait. I joined a rotary club to meet people and was given a project to build 20 water wells, Sumur, in Sumba. Now, I had actually no idea where Sumba was. I thought it was up the coast somewhere, but I found out it was uh, an hour and a quarter flight in a tiny little plane, which I always hated, and uh, three or four flights per week. Uh, three or four flights a week, which were generally cancelled because nobody really wanted to go to Sumba at that time. Um, luckily, I met the GM of Pro Air, the biggest water purification company in Indonesia, who seconded their engineer to me and gave me their blueprint plans, how to build a well, and put me on a water course, how to build them. Uh, however, uh, the villagers kept stealing my rocks, my sand and my cement. And when I challenged them, they replied, you don't understand, we're very poor. And I had to go back to the Rotary Club and say, look, I've got to apply for more money because I've had everything stolen. I'm not sure whether they believe me or not, but anyway, they extended a little bit more money and the whole project um, extended from nine to 15 months due to the rainy seasons getting in the way. I was beginning to understand the culture. Returning to Bali, my wife said to me, what are you gonna do now? I don't want you kicking around the house doing nothing. She learned to rue the day she said that. Um, sorry, here's the a, a, a first of my 20 wells giving water to 2000 people and also fruit and vegetable because I, I met a kid on Kuta Beach and he was a surfer and he said he was going to Sumba and when I asked him what he did, he said he was a landscape gardener. So I said, can you come with me and create a garden using the spillage from the water wells, which, which he did. So uh, this is the area in East Sumba that, uh, that, that, we, that I was doing it. Um, after, after coming back, uh, my wife and I decided to pay a visit to friends in Shanghai, one of whom was a British film producer guy called Arthur Jones, and he was walking around barefoot, making a documentary to raise money for libraries for poor children in Beijing. Now, having worked hard all my life, I felt it was time to give back. I, I didn't foresee at the time that I was gonna spend the next 10 years working harder than I've ever done in my life. And just like Sarah Chapman, for no money. Uh, sorry. I <laughs> Uh, just like Sarah, I don't have any regrets. You know, you, you, you can't put a price on how we've been able to change lives in Bali. My only regret, I have to say this, is I feel I is not being able to spend a little bit more time with my family, most especially now as I have a grandson. Anyway, I, I didn't want to write, try to raise money until I'd established credibility. So I, I pledged to go barefoot until I'd raised a million dollars for the poor and disadvantaged in Bali. Actually, I raised that about four years ago. Returning to Bali and, and aware that 75% of the orphanages in Bali were then run as illegal businesses, I asked fellow Rotarian Manko Madayariawan, a Hindu priest, businessman and leader of the Democratic Party in Bali to set up a charity, ensuring transparency and legalities, et cetera and telling him that he could open doors for me and I'd make him more popular. Well, this is exactly what's happened. And he's still our president. I also made a great friend of the then governor, Manco Pastica, who then 
became our Pelindung, our patron. And quite a few stories there. In 2011, I completed my first 535 kilometer barefoot walk around Bali. It wasn't just a barefoot walk. We gave health checks and health workshops every four days with a doctor and two nurses at villages who'd never seen a doctor. We were followed by two TV stations and a film crew, and we ended up with 23 videos on YouTube and the brand was born. There was a second walk in the following year in 2012. Now, I didn't want to raise, try to raise money until I established, until I'd established credibility. So I pledged to go barefoot, I just said, to, to after I'd raised a hundred million dollars for the poor and disadvantaged. I had many experiences going barefoot. One of the most memorable was that discussion at the top of the steps as I was attempting to board a Singapore Airlines flight. The stewardess said to me, well, you can't come on without shoes. Actually, she said, you can't come on without sandals. I said, well, I've got a ticket and I don't believe if you check your rule book that there's any law to say that I can't come on without shoes. I'd done my research and there wasn't such a thing. I knew that. I said, you know, I turned around and I said, um, do you think we should discuss this with the 150 or so passengers behind me? Uh, let's see what they've got to say. Anyway, she said, look, get on board. Didn't have, you know, spaff around with that. As we landed, the pilot came out and he made a beeline for me, which point I got quite nervous. And he said, look, I've checked up on who you are and what you do. And I'd like to give you this envelope. And he handed me an envelope. Um, I, I've done a whip round from the crew and we'd like to give you this for your charity. And, and would you mind stepping outside and having a, a photograph with me outside my plane? Well, weeks later, they actually asked us to put our charity boxes in their ticket desk, ticket offices, which was really great. Now, you, you might ask why, why I'd, I'd actually get off, asked this uh, occasionally, why I don't wear shoes now? Well, in February 9, uh, 2020, I contracted cellulitis, which is a bacterial leg infection. The hospital told me I was dangerously close to losing my life if it had gone into the lymph nodes, and it was very, very close. And they recommended from this point, I should wear shoes again. Well, having raised well over my pledges uh, of a million dollars some time ago, I agreed, much to the delight of my family. Well, the turning point. The turning point, quite frankly, was meeting Sarah Chapman, a British nurse for 28 years. And this led to the birth of our outreach programs. I had read on Facebook, she was riding on the back of a motorbike six hours a day, three days a week to see Annie, this little girl on the left, who was six years old and eight kilos. Six years old and eight kilos. She was also an abused child and the nearest thing to an animal I'd ever seen. She hissed and she bit, that's all she could do. Now the Smile Foundation, Yaya Sansenyam, had said, look, you know, you need to, she's got a cleft palate problem. You need to, we need to operate on her, but you, you, you can't until she's at least 12 kilos. Well, we got her into Sangla. Sangla had said that, uh, they needed us to pay for 24 hour caring, which I raised the money at the Rotary. And so we got that. And she turned into the most delightful little child. She had, she had played with friends. She'd never had friends before. She had toys, she never had toys before. We got her into EPHA, the disabled school in Jimbaran. And she was a delight, she really was. Uh, unfortunately, she just dropped down dead in the playground one day. At, at 11 kilos so you know we never made it to 12 kilos and 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 that was it really but we'd given her the most wonderful life for two months might may sound short but in in her life two months and and and, and that was it well following on from that um the, the, there'd be many 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 proudest achievements i know you asked me what are our proudest achievements with Solomon. Well, the proudest achievements are from Sarah and I caring for Annie to us progressing to a group of 
quite frankly, dedicated, skilled, loyal, passionate, and quite an awesome team, always reacting fast to any situation. We're quite proud of that. Another proud achievement is our growing reputation as one of the most popular and respected holistic healthcare NGOs with reputedly, I'm told, the lowest overheads in Bali. As I said, Sarah and I have never taken a salary. You know, we assist people living with disabilities, with mental health disorders, with acute or chronic illnesses, and their families by bringing them life-saving or life-changing assistance, palliative care, and food sustainability. We frankly pick up cases that no one will touch. After Annie, we were told of a house in Denpasar with 27 people and one toilet on just one and a half hour. Arriving there, we saw seven boys naked, lying on the concrete with twisted limbs as a result of, of, of cerebral palsy. Well, quite frankly, we had no idea what to do with this. You know, it was completely out of our level of comfort. We, had, we just didn't know what to do. And I approached JRX from uh, Superman is Dead. I think they had, I can't remember, nine million fans or something in Indonesia. And I said, look, these families are on your patch. They, they, they live in your area. Could you possibly do a concert with some of your mates? I'll get Hard Rock, to, I think, to do it. And we did it at Hard Rock. We had 15 bands, uh, Navicula, No Stress, uh, Superman's and quite a number of other ones, I can't quite remember now. And we raised 32,000 US dollars over a weekend of two concerts. And we rented some land next to, we called it the House of Horrors. And I'd, I'd got quite pally with Manku Pastica, the governor then. And he offered to um, pay for uh, two houses made out of reconstructed, uh, was re something wood, uh, reconstructed wood. Uh, and, uh, and he said, just get the uh, contractor to give me the invoices, I'll pay for that. He said, if you try and put it through the government, they might not do it and it'll take for a long, long time anyway. So we put up, uh, we put up two houses very close to where they were. We put a permaculture garden around the houses at wheelchair height so they could grow vegetables for themselves fruit and vegetables themselves and stuff for, um, for to sell to, to other people in, in, in the village. So that was absolutely magnificent. You see the boys on the left, that's how we found them. And just, I think it must've been a year or possibly a little longer, but there they are in their wheelchairs. Now we still look after these kids. Years later, we still look after these kids. This is the house that we made in recycle, there's the word, recycled wood. and. Everyone we treat receives ongoing holistic care. Now, more specific examples of proudest achievements are freeing our first person from years in Pasung. Pasung is the inhumane practice of incarcerating people with a mental illness. The government uh, banned this in 1977, but nobody takes a damn bit of note of that. And we've, uh, over the last few years, we've freed 52 people. All these people were previously caged or chained and are now free and reintegrated into society and still receiving our ongoing medical care. Made, we called him Made Cage. Made, that's how we found him on the left. And on the right, that's him at my birthday party at Potato Head. So it's absolutely wonderful. Every, every month pre-pandemic, we held monthly fun days, and Solman fun days to give kids a memorable day out. That was, that's all, and also for them and their families to be able to meet other families with similar conditions and challenges. This one I think was at Hard Rock Hotel, our first, uh, first supporter. We also take kids that can't be treated for heart conditions in Bali to Jakarta for heart surgery. These two children, Mariani and Arinata, are on their way. In fact, I think they've arrived right now for surgery in the next few days. And, you know, I, I haven't heard of anybody else doing this. We never go out looking for anybody. Everybody 
including Annie from the very first patient has always come to us through referrals. You know, from taking care of one child, little Annie, 10 years ago, we've now grown to assisting approaching 3,000 people all around Bali. Um, we have a, our headquarters is now a 10 bedroom care and recovery center in Kuta, and this provides pre and post operative care. Pre pandemic, we were often serving up to 90 meals per day for our patients. Now we, we actually limit it to 50% to because of the pandemic. I, I'm really very proud and humbled by these achievements. I really am. Your question, has Solman had to adapt to the pandemic and your recent health issues? Has Solman had to adapt to the pandemic? Oh my God, yes, absolutely. We were advised in March 2020 not to risk running out of money and not being able to help anybody and that we should go into cockroach mode, which a number of charities in Bali have done. Sarah and I are not the sort of people to take no for an answer. We're northerners from England, <laughs> although Sarah's from Manchester, I'm from Leeds. But anyway, we still get on. Sarah and I couldn't bear the thought of being unable to continue to provide food and medical aid for our soul buddies. That's our affectionate term for our patients. Instead, we became even more proactive. When the pandemic struck, more than 90% of our general funding is from the hospitality industry. And that disappeared overnight, as did most of, most of our monthly donors. Similarly, donations from individuals and corporate sponsorships all but dried up. And now all our donation box, all our donation boxes in more than a hundred locations are pitifully redundant. Thankfully, Solman, we put Solman food drive boxes into 11 locations of the leading supermarkets. And this has considerably reduced our monthly cost for food parcels. I remember going to see Grand Lucky and I went up to the uh, manager I'd, I'd never met before, he was in charge. And I said, explain the situation. And before I'd finished talking, he said, yes, when do you want to put it in? It's absolutely fantastic. And then Pepito for um, Arta Sedana and all the rest of them came in. And this is actually, is incredibly useful because you can't be delivering food one day and then, current, and then just stop. And similarly with our mental health program, you just can't stop uh, providing medical care from one month to the next. We had to reach into our reserves. And when they were exhausted, quite frankly, I took to begging from my old friends. I've got a lot of old friends because he's 73 years old. You, you, you develop quite a lot of old friends <laughs> and, I, and my network. And I pulled in favors wherever possible even from Richard Branson, actually, who kindly agreed, it, agreed to top up the final amount we needed to pay our rent at our headquarters, despite him telling me that he would told his company that he wasn't taking any more charities on board, uh, but he did it from his, from his family in that case. We've really had to think laterally outside of the box. I, I'd like to give you an experience of, of a video I sent to a very well-known person, the creator of a multinational company. I went on the beach to the uh, Hyatt in front of the temple and I said, uh, hi, so-and-so, I can't tell you his name because, it, you know, I don't think he'd like that. But um, I can't imagine that you know what's going on in Bali at the moment. People are dying daily, quite frankly, from malnutrition because of the pandemic. I'd like to have a chat with you if it's at all possible, see if you could help us. And I sent the thing off, the email. Of course, I didn't get a reply. So I went to see Chok Acha, the vice governor. He's the son of the last king of Ubud. And he calls me bro. And we've got a nice relationship. And I called him up and I said, can I come and see you? He said, well, I'm really busy. Can you send me a proposal? And I said, no, it's personal. Can I come and see you? So I went to see him and I showed him the video I'd sent. I said, I haven't got any reply. Can you get dressed up in all your ceremonial gear, stand in front of your desk with Jokowi behind you, with a picture of Joey behind you, and do the same thing? This guy can actually help Bali a lot. So he did. 
he, he sent me the most wonderful video, which I sent off to the guy in States. And the following morning, I got an email back from him. He said, do you know how many emails I get every day asking me for money? He said, but I've never received such two such quirky videos. I've got to talk to you. When can we, when can we speak? So I said, tomorrow morning, it's nine o'clock in the evening where you are, nine o'clock in the morning where I am, you know, choose it. When do you want to talk? So he said, okay, nine o'clock in the morning, your time. And lo and behold, he sent me a Zoom and he came on and I said, well, how long have we got? He said, an hour. So I said, okay. And I started talking about the charity and he put up his hand and he said, stop. I thought, oh God, we've upset him already. Uh, I, I said, what, what, what's, what's the problem? He said, well, I don't need to talk about the charity. I've researched your charity and I'm actually quite happy uh, about, about what it is and who you are and everything else. I need to talk about you. Anyway, we started chatting and I saw there was a guitar behind his desk. And I said, oh, you, you play guitar? He said, nah, I picked it up when I was seven years old. I can still play the same three chords. I said, ha ha, so do I, amazing. And then we talked about being a vegan and, and, and he couldn't do it really, he cheated and me too. And there was a great amount of commonality. I had the most wonderful chat with him and I looked down at my watch and the hour was up. And I thought, oh Christ, I've really blown this. I mean, it wasn't easy getting to this guy and now I've, now I've used up my hour and, and that's it. And he leaned back in his chair and he said, uh, what is it you want actually? And I said, well, we've actually run, we've almost run out of money. We, we've got money coming in at the end of the year. I'm very confident we've got money coming in at the end of the year through grants and, and trusts and things like that. I can't, I, I need a bridge to get to the end of the year. And he said, well, how much do you need? And I told him it was quite a lot of money. And he leaned back and he said, look, if I had to ask my company to do that, I'd have to call a board meeting. And I have no, no, no idea when the next board meeting is. And even if they did agree, you'd have to fill out paper like this. And I get the sense there's an urgency here. He said, if you don't mind, I'm gonna send you X. It was a lot of money, uh, thousands of dollars tomorrow morning from my family. Three days later, it was in our account. And I thought, oh, he said, don't, don't think you've got to report back to me and tell me what you've done with the money. I, I trust you. Uh, and when I come to Bali next, we'll, we'll hook up. And I thought, crikey, this guy is not the only person in the entire world that I can have a conversation with who knows nothing about me. And we have an hour's conversation and he's given me all this money. And I jumped into LinkedIn which I, I wasn't really familiar with. Um, a friend of mine, actually, Denara, she's on the thing, she's been helping with that. And I spotted on LinkedIn a, a, a company, and the owner said, I, my dream is to bring charity closer to business. And I fired off an email to him, and I didn't even look where he came from. I said, where are you? He said, I'm in Bali. Oh, I said, can I come and see you? I went to see him the next day, same conversation. Hello, how are you? Uh, how long we got? He said, as long as you want. Oh, crikey, that, that's good. And I went through the charity thing and I told him about all our projects. And at the end, this three hours later, he said, I've made my decision. I'm gonna fund one, two, or all three of the projects that you've just outlined. But just to show you, I'm not a bullshitter. I'm going to give you, I can tell you this amount because it's not that much in relation to the other amount. I'm going to give you $15,000 right now and uh, uh, just as a down payment and then we'll, you know, we'll start funding the projects. Now, I thought there's got to be more kind philanthropists like these. So now I'm currently searching for them. And if anyone, anyone on this webinar can refer me, please direct message me. That's one message I'd like to get across. Right, okay. On that note, uh, Robert, just looking at the time, a few more minutes. Um, Gosh. Are you, would you like to answer some questions from the audience? There's a couple coming through. Uh, yo, okay. Um, I can. I can't finish that, can I? Because it's on. quite a... Okay. Okay, yeah, well, carry on. 
yeah, we, we, most of our most of our uh, our income was from sales of retail merchandise for hospitality, you know, hotels, and it went down to zero. So now we're in the process of building online sales. I'm just explaining how we've adapted to the pandemic. We appointed a volunteer general manager for Solman, a great strategist and planner, 27 years in the military and nine years with Red Cross, and someone we really love. We're currently using this time to expand on our small team of committed volunteers under his guidance. We've recruited a grant specialist. We've recruited an experienced social media person. We've recruited a successfully uh, technology entrepreneur to streamline our processes, all volunteers. And we're using this time to restructure and build a framework for growth to be ready for post-COVID. During Selman's uh, 10th anniversary celebration next year, we're planning an important relaunch and possibly e e even rebranding. So um, you wanted to talk about my lung cancer, my recent health issues? Well, without going into it, um, I, I, the last five months in the last two years, I've been out of Bali at, uh, in countries of where there's been a higher level of care because I, I had um, lung cancer. And mm. as I'm the only fundraiser in the charity, uh, that's severely impacted on our finances. Anyway, I'm, I'm back, I'm firing on all cylinders. And so there's nothing to worry about there. This is just, uh, yeah, that was, a bit, that was in Valencia uh, this year. Um, and that's my family who came over to come and, and see me, which was wonderful because I hadn't seen my grandson and he's a year and a half. Wow. Um, some charities like Bumi Say How to Now Accept and Crypto. Yes, we are too. Just jump on our website and you'll, you'll learn all about that. What's the biggest challenge right now? It's obviously it's funding. Now, since the community of Bali has been devastated from the lockdowns and travel reducing tourism on the island to virtually nothing, uh, we see increasing numbers of people already are on the verge of homelessness, starvation and medical ruin. So um, we, we had a whole stock of uh, 500 soul teddies, which were giving us about $50,000 a year pre-pandemic. And ma I managed to sell them to Batter Shoes, who are now uh, launching these teddy bears. So that's one thing that we've, be, we've been doing. There's a prospectus to donors on our website. I won't sort of carry on a little bit more about that. You can jump on the website and see what you can uh, we're looking for partners to collaborate with us, really, for sponsorship of any part of that. We're also developing an exciting NFT. I'd like to give you my short words of wisdom, if I may. Um, you know, when we talk about social service, service to people, service to humanity, helping to bring change and peace to the world, often we forget that it's the very people around us that, that we have to live for, first of all. In the words of Thich Nhat Hanh, one of my favorite guys, if you cannot serve your wife or husband or child or parent, how are you gonna serve society? If you can't make your own child happy, how do you expect to be able to make anyone else happy? If all our friends in service communities of any kind don't love and help one another, who can we love and help? Are we working for other humans or are we working just for the name of an organization? And as an inspiration to other positive change makers, Napoleon Hill wrote, every adversity, every failure, every heartache, and in this case, every catastrophe carries with it the seed of an equal or greater benefit. I would urge everyone to find out what that seed of benefit is and do whatever is in your hearts. Most importantly, have constant gratitude and always be mindful and look after those closest to you. You know, during the past five months of treatment, my seed of benefit I discovered was gratitude. And using my practice of SGI Buddhism, chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo to dispel fear and boost my confidence, I'd urge others to take any action you can to handle the situation. Bravely overcoming one small fear gives you the courage to take on the next. A favorite quote is Lao Tzu, short one, fear knocked at the door, knowledge opened it and found nobody there. Have the confidence to overcome fear and the conviction you can change the situation. As my Buddhist practice reminds us, winter always turns to spring. Above all, never give up. 
and find that seed of benefit. I'll just give you one last quote from Goethe 200 years ago, which is really important, in, especially in this pandemic time. Until one's committed, there's a hesitancy, the chance to draw back. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans. However, the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. A whole stream of events, of events issues from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents and meetings of material assistance, which no man could ever dream would come his way. Whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius, power and magic in it. Begin it now. I'd just like to thank everyone for tuning in and for listening to me. And I'm sorry, I, go, I do talk a lot and I've gone over. I'm very, very sorry. And a special thank you to Adrian for giving me this opportunity to pre present on, on behalf of Soulmen at this very impressive World Bali Forum. Thank you very, very much. And Nam Yo Ho Ringeko. Thank you. Very good, Robert. Thank you very sorry, much. Very over. I think it was worth it. Um, we're, we're very inspired. And um, <clears throat> just a quick question before we move on to the next speaker. Um, good question, I thought, uh, from, uh, I can't see the name here. Uh, oh, from Aya. Um, how do you, I, I think I know the answer. We've been chatting recently. But um, her question is, how do you handle emotionally, you know, when you deal with so much hardship? You know, for example, that, um, that chap who was in that cage for mental, um, yeah, um, mental illness. You know that's so heartbreaking, and, and all the other situations. How do you make, how do you remain emotionally uh, resolute so that you can do your work? Well, I, I, I actually, I honestly don't know. I mean, I can't tell that story of Annie without tears coming into into oh god, tears coming into my eyes. I just can't do it, and it's and it's nine years later and it still affects me mm. i don't know my my wife wonders whether i get depressed or whatever and you know seeing what we see mm. i i can honestly tell you and i've been chanting uh for 36 years or something and i use my practice to protect myself and not to be affected i think most people who know me would say that i'm a very like, like you are you're a very cool cucumber <laughs> you don't get affected by the ups and the downs and you're not blown over by positive and by negative stuff or even positive stuff but I really use my practice I do my chanting and I feel very protected and I, I don't get blown over and I, I think without that I think I'd be a mess I really do very good thank you Robert Words of wisdom, very good.